Good evening, Africa. On this day that the people of Nyeri County here in Kenya woke up to the tragic news of the death of the governor, Dr. Wahome Gakuru. In Uganda, a crippling doctor strike enters day two today. Also tonight, we look at the level of political stability in the region and the role of the East African community as a stabilizing factor. Shortly, we'll be having that conversation with Martin Olo, a lawyer and political analyst, John Gashie, regional affairs analyst, as well as Abel Oyeyo, international affairs analyst. But first, as usual, let's go straight to our highlight tonight. The African Union mission to Somalia begins to scale down on its operations after 10 years of a push to stabilize the country. Despite resistance from the Anglophone-speaking Cameroon, Paul Beer is showing no signs of retiring after 35 years as president. French troops join forces from five West African nations in an anti-jihadist military operation in the Sahel region. And tonight, we'll be looking at the capacity of the East African community in resolving political and electoral disputes in the region. Well, and that last bit on our highlight uh, informs our Twitter poll tonight, and we are asking you, do you think the ESC, that is the East African community, has capacity to deal with political instability in East Africa? Do you think, do you believe the ESC has capacity to deal with political instability in East Africa in the wake of what is happening right in Kenya, the prolonged election period, what has happened in Burundi, and to, to some extent in Rwanda, where we've seen some political uh, detainees there. So, uh, we're asking you, do you think the East African community has capacity to deal with political instability in East Africa? You know the drill. Our Twitter uh, handle is at KTN News. You can as well tweet me at Yusuf Ibra. Remember, our hashtag is Bottom Line Africa, and I'm going to have that discussion with our guests shortly. But first, let's begin with some development in the Horn of Africa, that is Somalia and the African Union has announced that up to a thousand of its soldiers will leave Somalia by the end of this year as it begins to downscale the AMISOM security mission. Now, AMISOM says it is undertaking a series of troop movements aimed at realigning contingent compositions in various forward operation uh, bases across Somalia as part of exit strategy. Now, the withdrawal comes in the wake of two major bomb attacks in Mogadishu last month, which together left at least 370 people dead. Soldiers from Burundi, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda and Djibouti make up the 22,000 strong Amisom force fighting Al-Shabaab militants. Ambassador Francesco Caetano Medira, the AU representative to Somalia, has sought to reassure, saying they will work side by side with the government to defeat Al-Shabaab on all fronts. Over to Liberia now, where preparations for Liberia's second round were halted last week when the Supreme Court announced it was examining a complaint by the Liberty Party of third place candidate Charles Bramskin, who on Monday said all Liberians deserved fair elections. He spoke after Liberia's Supreme Court on Monday put the presidential runoff on hold until the Electoral Commission can investigate claims of irregularities and alleged fraud in last month's first round of voting. Former football star George Weah was initially set to face Vice President Joseph Bokai on Tuesday to determine who will replace Nobel Peace a prize laureate, Ellen Johnson Salif. Our effort is about the hundred, hundreds of thousands of Liberians who were denied the right to vote. It is about the unknown number of persons who voted more than once because they had voter registration cards issued by Amos Sibo and others who were given voter registration producing materials by the National Election Commission. It is about our parents. It is about our brothers and sisters, our children, our friends, our supporters, and every Liberian who stood online for hours to vote for a particular candidate. 
only to realize that uh, thereafter that the votes were not included in the count. I consider myself blessed, my friends, to be a part of this collective effort to stop and undo the grievous offense that has been meted out against the Liberian people. Of course, that is the leader of the Liberty Party of Third Place, uh, Third Place, that is the candidate of that party, Charles Bramskin, uh, speaking there. Now, over to some interesting story. And Cameroon's President Paul Bia is marking 35 years in office today. Yes, you heard me right, making him one of Africa's longest serving leaders. P Mr. Bia was first elected in 1982 when the country had a one-party system. However, even though the country now has a multi-party system, he has managed to cling on to power. In 2011, after a controversial rule change, which allowed him to run again, he won another seven years in office with 78% of the vote. The landslide victory raised eyebrows among his opponents. Uh, Bia is part of a select group in, of, of African leaders who have ruled their countries for more than 30 years now, with only Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe and Obiang Ngema in Equatorial Guinea in power longer. Now, the 84-year-old who critics accuse of being authoritarian is expected to stand again next year. Hmm. Now, journalists in Guinea have been out on the streets of the capital, Conakry, today, protesting what they call bullying and intimidation of the press by the authorities. Things came to a head uh, last week when false rumors that President Alpha Conde had died began to circulate and subsequently journalists from a privately owned gang and radio station were accused of starting the rumor and detained. Uh, col colleagues rather who went to secure the release were also beaten up by security forces, had the equipment destroyed and their radio station taken over. Uh, of the air. Now, the, uh, the government has yet to comment on the restrictions. A few days later, another radio station called Espes FM, possibly the most vocal in the country, was shut down by the authorities after journalists uh, there lampooned the status of the military as they celebrated 59 years of existence. We are in a country we are in a country today where we have a body which is supposed to protect the press, which is supposed to guarantee the independence of the press, and above all, to guarantee ourselves from any influence of our governments and political parties, which today puts itself in a position to gag us, to silence us, without any respect for the law. We have challenged at the Supreme Court level this decision of the High Authority of Communication to close us down. What we are demanding is that the Guinea press be stopped. The private press is not an enemy of the nation. If you are talking about a democracy in Guinea, everyone knows in recent years, decades, the place or the important role played by the private press in our country. Let me take you down south now of the continent and in South Africa, disgraced former hire. Education Deputy Minister Mdudozi Manana's sentencing has been postponed to Wednesday after documents arrived let at the Randburg Magistrates Court in Johannesburg, that is South Africa. He pleaded uh, guilty to three charges of assault earlier this year. Cell phone footage went viral in August, showing Manana and his friends assaulting three women at a popular night sport in Johannesburg. <laughs> So, here we are. I've committed uh, an omission. I erred. I did wrong, and that is why I'm in court. Justice must not favor me. Justice must equal. There has to be a punishment for what I have done and we we'll leave it to the court they have postponed the case to tomorrow we we'll leave it to the court to arrive at a determination I want justice to be served so that those who are victims the victims themselves are happy when they go home that actually justice is served we are saying to the family that they are not alone because seemingly everyone else that has come here they are celebrating uh, the perpetrator, which is, uh, in our opinion, uh, it's a sign of arrogance um, because you can't have someone 
who has uh, actually admitted to have to have assaulted women and then you come here and chant and sing and celebrate that person so we're here to support the victim over to Ethiopia now, the second, I believe, populous country in Africa. And the country has launched a civil registration program for refugees, allowing over 883,000 people in the country to legally register with authorities. Refugees can now receive birth, death, and marriage certificates, as well as divorce decrees to allow them to easily access services like education and health care. Now, birth registration is an important protection tool ensuring basic human rights, particularly in situations of displacement. It establishes a child's legal identity and can help prevent st uh, statelessness. Over 883,000 refugees living in Ethiopia will now be able to get legal documents recording vital events uh, like birth and uh, death certificates, marriage licenses, and divorce decrees to enable them to rebuild their lives and become a part of society. Documents have already been issued to refugees living in 26 camps and other urban areas. Now, over to Sudan and a controversial Sudanese counterinsurgency unit seized 19 tons of hashish in water on Darfur, in one of the largest holes ever reported in Sudan. Now, Sudan's Rapid Support Forces, RSF, usually used to crush rebels in the country's conflict areas, seized two vehicles loaded with hashish after a gunfight with smugglers in the state of South Darfur last week. On Sunday, the security forces showed tons of seized cannabis to reporters at an R RSF camp in Khartoum, that is the capital, dozens of blue plastic sacks full of hashish on display while some was spread out on a carpet in the compound of the camp. On Tuesday 31st, our troops clashed with a gang of smugglers. When we ambushed them, we captured their chief. We seized two vehicles loaded with 189 quintals of hashish. Oh, it's a similar story now, but this time around in Nigeria, where Nigerian authorities publicly destroyed over 54 metric tons of assorted narcotics in Kano as part of efforts to rid the city of illicit drugs. Now, Kano has the highest drug abuse rate in Nigeria. Speaking during a brief ceremony witnessed by Kano State Governor Dr. Abdullahi Omar Ganduje, the National Drug Enforcement Agency Chairman Muhammad Mustafa Abdallah raised the alarm over the high rate of Nigerian youths and women engaging in drug abuse and trafficking. According to him, the future of their youth should be paramount and from indication of the involvement of them in drugs the federal government he says must take immediate action to redeem their future and also tackle the menace of drug abuse <laughs> Seized by Kano State Command of the Agency as mandated by the courts. By seizing 54.244 metric tons of drugs, for a particular state, this is not a good story. Trend here in this state is more complex in that we are talking of seizures of multiple drugs with all of them. Well, over to some positive story coming out of Somalia and Somali troops training at the United Arab Emirates military camp in Mogadishu have graduated after completing an 18-month course conducted by military instructors from the Gulf State. UAE is providing security assistance to help the country fight threats by Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab and... Uh, and uh, at the camp since 2015, and uh, Somali Prime Minister Hassan Ali Khairi was at the ceremony where he addressed the soldiers. The weak uh, UN-backed government is now battling an Islamist insurgency, but many members of its security forces are badly trained and coordination is poor. The United Arab Emirates is a key ally of the Horn of Africa country and supplies it with key imports from electronics to building materials.
I congratulate the Somali military commander, the 311 well-trained and well-equipped forces are being handed over to you. As you know, Somalia's enemies have always been defeated by Somalis and Somali people who will overcome their enemies soon. We really thank the United Arab Emirates for the training they gave you at this camp, and now you're in the hands of your military commander, and I tell you that all the troops that are good soldiers never disobey good commanders. I tell you that Al-Shabaab has no tribe, and Al-Shabaab are not Somalis. They are the only enemy that we have in our country, and the only way that we can defeat them is to unite all Somali people. A long-awaited multinational military force in Africa's Sahel region has begun operations to counter escalating Islamist insurgencies, as shown in video from the French Defense Ministry, which was released today. Now, the G5 Sahel Force, backed by France and the United States, launched its campaign on October 28th amid growing unrest in the desert reaches of the Sahel, where jihadists such as Al-Qaeda and Islamic State affiliated groups roam and detected, often across long porous borders. Now, last month, Islamist militants killed four U.S. soldiers and at least four Nigerians in an ambush that highlighted the risk of operating in the remote region. G5 Sahel is made up of troops from Mali, Niger, Chad, Burkina Faso, and Mauritania uh, that will police uh, their border region in collaboration with 4,000 French troops deployed there since intervening in 2013 to beat back, uh, to beat back an insurgency in northern Mali. Well, and that report there from the Sahel region takes us to a very short break. But when we return on Bottom Line Africa, we'll have a studio discussion tonight which revolves around the East African community. Do they have any role whatsoever when it comes to the political dispute in the region? If yes, why the loud silence in the wake of what is happening in Kenya? We've seen crisis in Burundi and to some extent in Rwanda. We have our guest ready with us in the studio, Martin Olo, lawyer and political analyst. We also have John Gashie, who is a regional affairs uh, expert and analyst, as well as Abelou Yeyu, who is an international affairs analyst. We'll have that discussion and much more. Don't go too far. We'll be right back.